Hi there. Thanks for joining me here on Conversations for Yoga Teachers. I'm your host, Karen Fabian, the founder of Bare Bones Yoga and the creator of the Momentum Magic Method, the way to become a confident teacher, one who effortlessly walks around the room, shares clear cues, easily builds sequences, and speaks from her heart, sharing authentically with her students. On the podcast, you'll hear anatomy lessons, stories from teachers, interviews with others in the field, and a dose of personal growth because having a strong, healthy mindset is such an important piece of being a confident teacher. In addition to the podcast, follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Bare Bones Yoga for daily videos. And you'll also see a new link on both of my profiles, my stand store link a literal vending machine for you to select how you best want to be supported as a teacher. There you'll find links to the podcast, free resources, and other ways I can help you be the best teacher you can be. And don't forget, every single week, in addition to recording you a new episode of this show, I also teach yoga classes and free workshops specifically for yoga teachers. The only way to get your invite is to be on my mailing list. You can do that simply by going to my website, barebonesyoga.com, and down at the bottom, entering your email in the box. Here we go with today's show. This is episode 292. I'm going to be really quick with the intro here because this is another amazing interview episode, and I'm really excited to share with you this episode and my conversation with Joanna Sapir. This is going to be a really good one. So you might even want to get your notebook out. I want to share with you before I give you an intro of Joanna and we launch into that episode, I just want to touch base with you because, you know, here on the podcast, I record these episodes weekly and I want to just leverage this time that I'm literally in your ear, this kind of one-to-one relationship that we have, whether you're a first time listener or many time listener. This week, I wrapped up the first session of my it factor training. And all I can tell you is it's amazing. The teachers that participated in this group training are absolutely loving it. It's a four session training designed to help you tap into your it factor. This is that quality. You know, when you go to a yoga class and the teacher just has it going on, you just know that this person knows their stuff. They're walking around the room. They don't use notes. If they do use notes, it's because they want to. They don't feel like they have to. They don't trip over their words. They don't get lost in the sequence. They're confident. They're engaging with their students. It's just someone who you just, as a student, have a really good sense that they know what they're doing. This is what I call the it factor. And I have developed a four session training specifically designed to help pull this empowered part from you so that you can be leading with this when you go into your classes. All you need to do is send me a DM with the words it factor training, and I will send you the link so you can find out more about this training program, this unique training program, and enroll yourself. This is not time dependent. This is not even dependent on you being part of the next group. You can do this on your own working with me, or you can do it when I launch it as the next group of teachers that do it together. So there's no constraints on your time. You can do it as you want, or you can do it as part of a group. It's completely flexible to meet your schedule. The most important thing is I want you to get in on this because this is a really unique training designed to help you feel more confident and empowered. So again, all you need to do, you're on your phone right now. You can just hop over to my Instagram, bare bones yoga, and just send me a DM with the word it factor training. Okay. We are going to launch into this really interesting and exciting and empowering conversation I had with Joanna Sapir. If you're a longtime listener of the pod, you know that she was on uh, before about two years ago, almost to the day. And if you haven't, this is going to be a really wonderful introduction to her. Joanna is a business strategist for holistic practitioners, particularly those that integrate multiple modalities. She has a special ability in helping practitioners set up repeatable systems and processes in their businesses to serve their clients more powerfully, enroll committed long-term clients, and create steady income and cash flow. 
She has been a teacher and trainer for more than 20 years, from the classroom to the gym floor, and now to wellness practices across the world. Born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, she is a mother of two, a USA Masters National Champion in Olympic-style weightlifting, and the host of the Business Revolution for Practitioners podcast. I'll tell you up front, her website is Joanna Sapir, S-A-P-I-R.com. During this episode, she shares two special events that she's doing in the coming weeks. Both of these events are linked in the show notes. I also want to just say that this is a conversation both for people who own yoga studios, yoga teachers who own yoga studios, yoga teachers. So regardless of what you just might be thinking as you're listening and whatever kind of relationship you have with yoga, this is absolutely a conversation for you. So with that, let's hop over to my conversation with Joanna. Here we go. Okay, great. All right. So hello. I am so glad that we're here. I've been looking forward to this, reconnecting with you. And so I'd love for us to start with who you are, where you are in the world, and what is it that you do? Yeah. Thanks for thanks for inviting me here, Karen. Sure. Um, my name is Joanna Sapir. This is my second appearance here. <laughs> yes. And I'm in Sonoma County, California, which is a just gorgeous place to live. Yes. And I am a business strategist for wellness practitioners. I teach wellness practitioners how to build the systems and structures in their business to bring in higher income with less effort. Got it. Okay. Wow. So, you know, my listeners are yoga teachers. I mean, the name of the show is Conversations for Yoga Teachers. And I know that oftentimes when I talk to them, either when they enroll in my program or social media comments or phone calls I do, a lot of times yoga teachers will say things like, I'm just teaching classes. I'm not in it for the money. Or (laughs) just teaching classes on the side. It's not really a business. Some people actually kind of cringe when they hear the word business and yoga in the same sentence. I know I'm throwing a lot at you here. I'd love though, especially to catch the person who's listening right now, who's going to opt out of this conversation. And we didn't talk about this question I was going to ask you, but since you launched the conversation in that way, I want to catch the yoga teacher who's listening so that you can bridge that gap between their belief that I'm not the kind of yoga teacher who can have a business or who even wants a business, you can start to bridge that gap so that they can get value from what you're going to share. So yeah. take that in any direction. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's, I mean, I would say, so I work with a variety of wellness practitioners, but plenty of people in the yoga world. I mean, a lot. So I know that there's even some explicit teachings in yoga, like there is pride around, you know, um, around uh, not not seeing it as a business. But I will also note that every single practitioner that I work with feels that way to some extent. We don't get into this work uh, because we're trying to get rich or make money. We are all here. And I should have, I should have explained that the way I got into this work myself was that I owned a fitness studio for about 10 years. And I had come from public school teaching. Like I had no background in business whatsoever. I have always been in these helping professions. Same, same here, same here. (laughs) And we don't do this. We didn't get into any of this work for the money. Like, so that's just across the board. Um, that said, um, if you listening truly don't have to make a living, I mean, first of all, huge privilege, kudos to you, like also recognize your privilege. That's a big deal. When I started my, um, fitness business, this was 2008, um, I was newly a single parent of two young kids and did not have, I will say, did not have, a. uh, 
partner who had any money. So there was no child support coming in. So for me, my business actually had to make me a living. So I've never had the luxury of my business not. And I've continued. My kids are now in college and I am their, I am their sole support. So I haven't had that choice. And if you don't have the, if you do have that choice, again, there's something to acknowledge in that. But if you truly don't, don't have to make a living doing this, what good in the world do you want to do that more money will allow you to do? The fact is we live in a capitalist system we we live in a system that requires money for food, for clothing, for shelter, things that I personally believe should be human rights, but they are not human rights in our culture, in our society, and lots of people go without them. There is great inequity, and if you don't need to make a living doing this, is there some way you can contribute to more equity in the world and, and, and human rights for all? I imagine that anyone listening has causes that they care very much about. Can you imagine having the means to contribute financially to those causes? Again, because the society we live in, it is money that makes it go. Mm -hmm. So just want to say that. Also want to know, I have had more than one client who uh, in, in, they, they happen to all be women who were in um, marriages with men and who started working with me and the husband was the breadwinner totally didn't need to, didn't need the, their business, the, the wives in this case, didn't need the business to be, uh, you know, supporting the family in any way. And again, more than one case where the husband actually lost his job or decided to make a big life shift. Mm. And then they suddenly needed the mm. partner the partner's business to actually be supporting them. Yeah. And the beauty is that because they were already working with me, boom, they made that shift. Yeah. Um, so it's really, it's been really interesting to see that happen <laughs> because I sure never, I don't know their, you know, relationships. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know that that, you know, could happen. And it has totally happened more than once. Um, yeah. So I guess I'm just coming from a very, very practical standpoint and not from a like spiritual or mindset piece. Mm -hmm. um, that spiritual mindset piece, I would actually love to hear what you say, Karen. Um, I mean, we, we uh, to me, there's just a reality and I am a very pragmatic person and there is just the reality that we live in this system. So we may not like the system, but that doesn't mean that money itself is bad. It actually is the tool that we require again for even what I think are human rights, but yet it's required for us, you know? Yeah, I, I totally hear what you're saying. And I'm, you know, as a yoga teacher and a pragmatist, I sort of feel sometimes like a square peg in a round hole, but that pragmatism I have literally helped me leave my six figure corporate job many, many years ago and craft a plan to allow me to teach yoga in a way that supported me. Um, the thing that comes up for me when we're talking about this is this idea that if we lead the conversation with the money issue, that sort of takes away from the impact issue. And that's why when a yoga teacher says to me, oh, I'm just teaching on the side. I don't really care about the money in a way that's so dismissive to me, it's like behind that statement is a yoga teacher who's basically saying, I don't really need to really focus on what I'm doing, like from a big deal perspective, because the money is not really the issue. And it's like, I'm not saying the money is the issue. Wouldn't it just be amazing if you can be the most amazing teacher possible? And just as a side effect, you teach more classes, you have more people in your classes, and maybe you're paid based on how big your classes are. Maybe you are inspired to offer workshops. Maybe you're inspired to teach privates. And now you have the courage and the confidence to do that. And you love what you do. You're making a bigger impact. And oh, by the way, you're making more money. So I always feel like those kinds of statements really are masking a belief that I'm not worth it, or I don't deserve this, or there's something about making money in the yoga industry that is bad, or there's a story around that, a belief around that. So I don't know if that brings up anything that you've covered in working with people. Yeah. I mean, the part you said about masking, that's a good, really good way to put it. 
I, you know, this is going um, sort of like to the end line really fast, yeah. but ultimately in the work that I do with people, ultimately it's a process, uh, even though I'm teaching systems and structures and step-by-step -step pieces, what it all adds up to is practitioners stepping into leadership mm -hmm. of their clients, of their businesses, of their whole lives. It's an right. empowerment piece. Yeah. And when you're talking about that masking, that's, that's a hiding piece. That's like the opposite. That's like, no, this doesn't really matter. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not, when sometimes I just say, even in like my free trainings, even right here, you know, I say like, it's your, you, wherever you want your business to be, whatever you want it to be like, it's your job to lead it there. Like you have to step into leadership of it. Right. And even that itself can be just like, you know, revolutionary for people like, oh, this is actually something I control and I take right. the reins of. And right. yes, you do. Right. right. Yeah. And I love that vision of stepping into it's like I'm on one side of the fence and on the other side of the fence is this beautiful garden and I can open the gate and step into that more empowered, beautiful, confident way of being where I'm just completely in flow as I'm teaching. It's so easy. And now I'm just noticing these other things are happening, but it starts from me, as you say, controlling in a good way, how I'm showing up, what I'm doing. I'm owning my most empowered way of being. And now all these lovely side effects are coming up, like more people in classes and more opportunities. And me having the confidence to say, like I had a conversation with one of the teachers in my program and when she graduated from it, I said, well, what's a good next step for you? And she said, oh, I'd love to offer some workshops, but I don't know that I have anything to offer that somebody else hasn't already offered. And, you know, in that statement is a lack of belief in her worth and mm -hmm. her impact and her own yeah i mean you can teach an mfr workshop and i can teach one but how you teach it and i teach it is totally different because we're totally different. yes we have to own who we are as teachers to take that step into that garden okay so i didn't know we were going to go to the heavy stuff first but i love that we we did i think it's it's super important what i'd love to when you mentioned framework i am a huge framework person like just in my head i'm a flow chart person and a process person and I know, or my sense is that that is, that infrastructure is part of like the bread and butter or the bones and muscles and fascia of what you do. Yes, yes. So why don't you share a little bit about what that looks like and what these frameworks are for working with, you know, maybe we can frame it as yoga teachers, but. I'll sure. Yeah. 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 And, you know, so many people tell me that they, their own practitioner training provided none of that, right? Not only did it not provide business structure, but even sometimes the teaching, like what's the structure to how I even teach this? Uh, just for example, I, I have an Alexander Technique teacher who, you know, went through all the deepest Alexander Technique trainings and there's actually no frameworks to it. It's just kind of, you know, the practices. Um, so yes, I absolutely operate with frameworks and systems and structures. My standard framework, and and I just want to note, I will, I do have an invitation for all of your people to a free event, yes. a free week long event, and I want okay. to note that I'll be teaching in depth my primary kind of foundational framework, which I call the client champion formula. Perfect. Yeah, we're gonna put that in the show notes. Your um, assistant sent me also a download, something that they can download. So I'll put that in the show notes, just as a note. So we're recording this on the 16th. This will go live on the 22nd. When is your... It is sometime mid-May. I'll have okay. to... So we have to obviously. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. So yes, absolutely. I would love to share that. Yeah. So in essence for, this is like this beginning level piece. Like if your your business is, uh, you know, sort of, you, you may be booked and busy, you may have up and, up and downs, you may have some classes going since it's yoga, you may be teaching classes. I think actually that's what we talked about a, quite a bit last time, maybe Karen was one-on-one, -on -one, designing yeah. journeys one-on-one -on -one for clients. Mm -hmm. um, so whether you're doing classes one-on-one, -on -one, whatever it is, and you know things are rolling, but it's not predictable, it's not steady, you don't have kind of a steady flow of, for example, income. And you know maybe people are not in any sort of, like they're in a 
drop in mode with you because that's what you're offering. So this is for that. So we have three main components to the client champion formula. The first one is understanding that there are the right people for you. And so it is so classic that we kind of just take anybody who shows up. And I just do want to know, because you train people who are fairly new, you know, when maybe when they're first leaving, but I know that other people listen to this, even who have been further along. When you're just starting, I really do think you take everybody that comes and you try it all out. You have to learn. You have to learn about, you know, who you work well with, who you don't, what problems you can help, what problems you can't, personality styles, different needs in, you know, in queuing and coaching and so on. So in the beginning, but as you start to progress in your business, you actually get to start honing in and focusing in on who are the people that I love working with and that see the best results and start to look at who those people are. And what are the commonalities, right? Whether it's their, you know, usually in business, people kind of get hung up on demographics, things like yeah. age and income. That's actually sort of the least important unless there's very prominent patterns that you see. But what about their pains and their problems and their goals and their desires? What about their personalities? What about their drive? All of that we call psychographics. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's going to be really important to, to look at who are the best people for me? Like who really gets great results and I enjoy working with them. We have a, you know, who's my vibe basically. Let so me, they, let yeah. me just jump in here just for one quick second. Cause I'm thinking about this for someone who's listening, who's primarily teaching classes. So they're going into a yoga studio. They don't have a lot of control over who's coming to their classes. What I would love to get your thoughts on is if we sort of, take what you're describing and just slightly shift the framework to one where if I'm a yoga teacher and I can't really control who's coming to my classes, I can control teaching in a way that attracts my ideal person by really, and this is kind of like what we were talking about earlier, owning what I love about teaching and showing up as a teacher, teaching classes that really allow me to share what I love. So like, I'll use me as an example. I love anatomy. I teach anatomy. My classes are very functionally based. I am not a super like energetically focused yoga teacher. You're probably not going to get chakra languaging in my classes, but I love that. And sometimes I do, because I can talk about root chakra from the perspective of anatomical position and grounding into your ankle joint, right? I can sort of reframe it. So the more I step into my most empowered way of teaching, my classes are going to be more anatomically focused. So I'm naturally going to draw people who like that kind of class. Matter of fact, I used to teach at this studio where the woman before me was the super energetic queen and she, her classes were packed. And initially I was sort of triggered, like when I would go for that class transition that she had a lot of people coming out of her classes. But then I was like, that's not who I am as a teacher because I went and took a class to do a little recon and I was like, I love this, but this is totally not me. And now I see she's attracting those students and I just completely released any feelings of jealousy and instead transmuted those feelings of jealousy into owning more of who I am and attracting my students. So I guess what I'm wondering is, this is sort of a long way around to the question, if the listener and most of my listeners are probably teaching open classes versus like what you're talking about, where I can sort of attract the ideal client, maybe to my private sessions where I can really track their progress and attract a certain kind of client. Is that sort of owning who you are as a teacher also a way of actually doing what you describe attracting your ideal person? Well, let me back up and say my premise would be that you can control who comes to your classes. So I don't, you can, you can tell me what we're talking about here, but who I'm speaking to is people is business owners. So, you know, anybody who's listening, who's a studio owner, a studio owner, hundred percent, but you're talking about teachers in classes. If, if, if you're listening and you're an employee you don't have your own business and we're, I'm, I'm basically not talking to you, but, okay, if you're, no. but if you're an independent contractor at a yoga studio. Yeah. Yes. That is the case. I would okay. say 99 if, times out of a hundred. If you're an independent contractor, technically you own your own business. 
Yes. That is how, I mean, it, it may be that your um the owner of the studio should have hired you as an employee. That could be the case because if they're expecting you to do things the way they want, right. that's an employee. But if you've been hired as an independent contractor and you are, you're teaching your yoga classes as yeah. you want, that is technically you have your own business. And therefore yeah. in your class descriptions and in any of your marketing okay. that you do, yeah. you a hundred percent can be calling out to your ideal clients. Got it. Okay. So it is at the same time, Karen, is what you're talking about, like your style, what you like to focus on. That absolutely would be included. But what I want to note is that I just, I have to say, I, I, I wanted to use this and yay, I get to use it. I just returned yesterday from um, an in-person retreat with my clients here in, in Northern California. Um, and it was a marketing retreat. It was so incredibly uh, powerful and beautiful. Like who knew a marketing retreat could be so like beautiful? <laughs> And it was, but one of the key messages that I teach in marketing is that it's not actually about you. So it's not saying I teach this way and I teach this way. It's talking to your people and calling to them and showing them that you see them, you see their goals, you see their problems, you see their pains, you see their desires, you see this, and you're offering them your solution. And so I totally believe with your class titles, with your class descriptions, that you can be calling in who those yeah. right people are for you. Got it. Got it. And I want to just also note for the listener that I know we went a little bit into like employment law and employment kind of stuff when we were talking about 1099, but I want people to not get confused by that or into the weeds around that. And what I heard uh, when we went into that little piece there is so empowering so that the yoga teacher who is listening, who works and teaches classes in someone else's studio, they are in control of a business. They own totally. their, like, yes. an independent contractor. If I teach at studio A, I teach at studio B, I do privates with clients in my home. I go to the nursing home across the street and I teach senior yoga. I'm a business owner. That totally. is and yeah. I craft it how I want. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. So that's so that's the first part is the right people for you and really understanding who the right people are so that you can call them in. Yep. The second piece of the client champion formula framework is um, I say stop selling sessions and start creating programs. And so we probably talked a bit about this when we talked about it one on one, but you can do the same thing for groups. So instead of offering drop in classes or packs of classes. Um, and this is a huge shift for many people. I just want to acknowledge that. I'm about to say it. I talk about it all the time and all my clients do it. It's what they do with me. So it's so normal to me, but I know it's a big shift. But instead of offering sessions or packs of sessions, you create a container of some sort that takes your clients on a journey. And so in a group setting that could look like, there's a number of ways you can do it. And I, I really want to note that this isn't a cookie cutter approach where I can say, this is how you do it because it's actually based on who your people are and what you as a practitioner believe they need. That's how we design it. So it could look so many different ways. All of my clients design such different looking containers. They can be different. I mean, I have people who have, you know, year long programs. I have people who have six week programs. It just really, really depends on your work. But in the case of yoga, to throw out a few examples, it could be that it's kind of like a membership model, right? Like that's sort of not as a journey like, but it could be that you offer, you know, three month memberships, six month memberships, nine month memberships or something. Um, but a more defined container would be that it actually has a start and an end. This could be like sessions or a particular program where people are signing up for a 12 week program that has a beginning, a middle and an end that has milestones to it, that has these certain touch points where every client that enrolls, again, this can be a group class or it could be one-on-one, -on -one, whatever you want, but there is a process that you're taking everyone through. And there's some sort of, like I said, touch points or milestones or pieces. And there's something that we are 
achieving together in the end mm -hmm. and achieving may not fit with yoga, like experiencing together. There's something where you're adding together the experiences where the sum is greater than the whole of its parts, right? It is yeah. not just 12 classes or 24 yeah. classes or whatever it is. It's an actual journey that you're taking them on. Yeah. Um, and when you do that, for example, you can end up, you can end up with thematic stuff. I'm just trying to think with yoga. Again, I have so many different practitioners that do different things, but um, you could have thematically based, you know, sessions, or there could be levels based sessions where like here are foundational levels pieces. And then here's like kind of next level pieces. Right. So it again, really depends on, I mean, what I hope you all listening here is kind of gets, I hope that it gets the juices flowing and gets you excited, like creatively, because um, this is, this is the exciting stuff as a practitioner. And, and again, like you were noting, Karen, that what you were hearing out of that, um, even if I'm a contractor teaching in different places that I, it's my business and I'm in charge, it's back to that leadership thing is this is you as a leader getting to go like, what do I want my people to experience? You know what, and, and all of you, you're, you're in this because you experience some transformation through this work yourself and you know, what's possible. Right. But how many people, when you just offer sort of, you know, classes drop in this and that, how many people drop in and like, don't stay consistent, fall off. You never see them again. Right. right? It's kind of like this small percentage actually become the sort of converts or lifers. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm proposing is that that pretty much a hundred percent of your clients are those folks because yeah. you're taking them in this container and getting their commitment. So I'm just going to say the third part of the framework, cause it's just three, which is a sales process. And that's where people who, uh, you know, get freaked out about money and business go, ah, sales, that sounds so awful and sales process. But all that means is that you need a repeatable and predictable step-by-step -step process that actually enrolls people in that container right? The drop-in model or the, you know, buy a pack of sessions model is, um, we don't, we don't do anything. We just stick it on our website or something, right? That that's a complete absence of a sales process. That's like, it's, it's really interesting because that is actually to me, like the most, um, unfeeling, um, like money only kind of capitalist, like unspiritual way of, of, you know, quote unquote sales is like, I press a button on a website, you know, and sign up. Whereas what I teach is a consultative sales process, which is so like, um, c connection based and really heart centered. So in a consultation, you offer a free consultation es essentially. And it's not like, oh, if you want a free consultation schedule, it's everyone. Even if it's your sister and your mom want to join, you still do a consultation with them because in the consultation, you actually really get to understand why is somebody here? What is going on with them? Like, what are their issues that are coming up with their physical, mental, emotional, any of it, whatever the, you know, parts that you're going to be serving and working with, and you understand what their goals and desires are. And you uncover all those pieces so that you're on the same page and you're making sure that this container that you've designed is going to serve them, right? So it's not like you're, this is part of where you don't necessarily take anyone. You may get somebody with, you know, some kind of like, if we just stay physical, some kind of like severe injuries that are just outside of your scope, right? And, and they're coming, hoping that you're going to, you know, quote unquote, fix them. And you want to be able to say, I won't, here's what I can do for you. But if you're looking for that fix, it's going to be another practitioner. And here's who I recommend. I say kindly refer, refer to people in your network, but the consultation is where you're really making this connection with people. There is a definitely a right way to do it. And that's how you enroll people into a committed program. It's how you are. It's essentially, let me just be really clear too. It's totally consensual. We are not talking about any sort of like, you know, manipulation or pushing or pulling or any of that. Mm -hmm. How I describe it is you're putting stepping stones in front of people. So it's, and you're just inviting them. Would you like to take that step? And if they take that step, then you put another stepping stone. Would you like to take that step? That's what the whole process is like so that they are totally consensually and from an empowered stance. Yeah end up saying, yes, I want to do this program, whether it's 12 weeks or six months or a year long with you. And that's how you have already, you have already connect, connect, uh, created the connection even before they start their first class. Mm -hmm. That is that, that does that. 
So yeah. those are the three components. Yeah. Okay. So I want to just, um, again, I'm kind of thinking in dual ways. I'm thinking for the person who's listening, that's teaching classes and studios that they don't own, how can they hear step two and leverage what you shared in step two to create more repeatable people to their classes? And when I heard you describing step two, I was thinking about, and just remind me, how did you phrase step two? What was the I say create a journey or a journey. Right. yes. Okay. So I want to just translate or kind of give you an example and see if this resonates. So if I'm a yoga teacher and I'm teaching classes in someone else's studio, I heard that step two and I thought, oh my God, what a great idea for a yoga teacher to pitch to the studio owner instead of just a one day workshop event for two hours, why don't I pitch to the studio owner a five session package or experience or journey or something that allows the studio owner to engage a number of students and allows me as a teacher to work consistently over maybe four Saturdays in a row with a distinctive group of students who I'm going to take. It's not like I'm saying sign up for five classes. I'm saying okay. in this experience, these are the results you're going to get. Come every Saturday from 10 to 11. And by the fourth Saturday, you will have transformed in these ways. So that gives me a way to define what I want to do to that type of person who I want to serve. It allows the studio to create a package opportunity where students can shift from a particular place to a better place. Is that something that kind of could fit in your model as an opportunity? Does that kind of match the step two? As long as it works, I mean, as long as it works for the practitioner in their setting, I yeah. will just note, like I have had from from my um from my first time I was on your podcast here, um, I, I definitely met people who heard me through this podcast and they were owners of their businesses. They were not people who were working in studios. So just want to say like, you so do we'll have, have people those, in your audience. Yeah. yeah we'll have those folks too. Yeah. I mean, it's always kind of funny because I talk out to the void and unless yeah. somebody gets like, I see views and I see downloads, but it's sort of agnostic to, I see what countries they're in, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so the other thing, uh, I lost my train of thought on step three. Okay. Be that as it may. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about now, how does it actually, what, what, what are you actually doing with folks when they're working with you? Like, what does that actually look like? Yeah. So my, um, primary program, like my, my front step program is called the business revolution Academy. And that is a, a whole like deep dive nine month step-by-step -step process where we build all three of those pillars that I just mentioned. We uh, figure out who are the right people for your business. We design, you design your programs and containers for them. You price them profitably based on what the business needs and what your salary goals are or what even your giveaway goals are, right? Um, that's actually really something we talk about, like uh, giving away money and scholarships is totally part of it, but you have to be priced right to do that. And then we build your whole sales system. And so all of this is a combination of um, a combination of manual stuff and there's automations involved as well. So we install those for you and and we so you finish the program with all these structures built and these repeatable processes. So what people come to the program in is selling sessions generally. That's what they've been doing, whatever their practice is, and they leave. Uh, enrolling clients in these programs. So they're, they're getting long-term committed clients and it's pretty profound because uh, just like I was mentioning, <clears throat> you know, when you just have sort of drop-in sessions or drop-in classes, how it's only like that teeny few that become the like real committed lifers, right? Um, it is, it is a massive like transformational shift. You were talking about impact before like the level of impact is, you know, 10 X basically like so much more when a hundred percent of your clients are becoming those, 
yeah. those committed clients and getting those results. So it's a huge impact. And like you said, side effect, which yeah. is a good way to put it is you have higher income. And then a really important piece of this for me is because really like the sweet spot of who my right people are is practitioners who I say are busy and booked. So I got a lot of people who, for example, are really making, who come to me making a totally decent income and are just burned out, overworked, slammed. They're really just booked all the time and in a model where they're just booking as many sessions as they can all the time, right? Yeah. And so what we're doing is clearing all kinds of space and making it so much easier to make that same income or higher in less time. Got it. Okay. Now, one of the things I know we covered in the first time you were on the pod, but I want to go into today, because I even think about like when we were talking and saying June, 2022 was the last time we chatted on the podcast. Like I'm so different now than I was mm -hmm. back then. Like the things that I talk about when I train teachers, the, just like, you know, how we both kind of evolved. Right. And even though, so even though I'm going to ask this question, I'm sure you're going to have a different take on it than what you shared back then. How did you get into this kind of work? Because I know that you said you, I think you mentioned early in the show here, you had your own. I owned a gym. Yeah. Gym. yeah. So how did you make the shift? Why did you make the shift from that to what you're doing now? Yeah. Well, I will say this. So I, I mentioned how I was, I was a high school history teacher for 10 years and I went through a very oof, like massive personal change. I had a traumatic birth with my second son and it just kind of shook my whole life up. And then I left the father of my kids and I ended up leaving teaching at that point, not necessarily thinking I was leaving education, but I, I did. And I sort of up and moved to a, a brand new place. I was just like starting a new life. And that's where I am now, Sonoma County. And when I moved here, um, I had found, I had been training in strength and conditioning. This is like barbell work. And it had changed my life to find strength, strength training in the midst of that kind of uh, recovering from that trauma and so on. Strength training had really, really shifted my life. And so when I moved up here, I couldn't find a place to do this really particular style of training that I was doing. And so I kind of was like, hmm, I guess I'm going to have to do this on my own in some way. Um, and so I started doing it and people started coming and asking me to teach them. And so I ended up opening this gym and I always say like, I, it was by accident. I mean, I did not have aspirations of becoming a business owner at all. Again, public school teacher, like it was just not in my, definitely not in my family systems to like own a business or anything. So I, I started the business really, um, by accident is what I said, but of course there was intention behind it. And I really wanted to create this service for my community because it didn't exist here. What I discovered just very soon was that I didn't know how to run a business. I absolutely knew how to, how to teach people on the gym floor. I was really good at that. Um, but the business structures and systems, like I had never done it before and nobody had ever taught me. And so I, I hit burnout really fast. And that's when I realized, oh, I can't even keep, I can't do this business unless I learn how to do it right. It can't just be me showing up all the time. Again, I had two little kids, you know, a single parent, like it was pretty insane in the beginning. So I set about deciding, like, I'm going to start learn. Let me learn how to do business. I mean, and I did, and I started building the systems and the structures and that included building a staff. So it wasn't just me. And, 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 you know, really having the systems to train staff and so on. And it was in that process that I realized, like, actually, you know what happened? As somebody came as the business was going and really thriving. Somebody showed up out of the blue. This guy showed up out of the blue and wanted to buy it from me. And I think that probably was the first seed that was planted. Like, oh, I see. I could sell this, you know, um, because I say that I started it by accident. I didn't think it was my life's work. Do you know what I mean? It was like, it was definitely making me a living. I definitely was loved, just loved the transformation that people received from it. I mean, it was just, you know, it's again, it's like why we do it. Right. I mean, that was just like the best part. Um, but I also knew like, 
I've built this thing and these transformations can keep happening even without me. Like I don't have to be the ones to do it. I, I have built now the systems and the structures for that transformation to be delivered the way I want it to be delivered, you know? And so I started to have a vision for, okay, well, why don't I build this to really be like very valuable and sell it? And so that's what I set about doing. So I knew that I wanted to sell it um, a few years in and, and was just, uh, was just staying in it for as long as I truly was loving and enjoying every aspect of it. And when I was ready to move on, I, I did, but I, before I, I knew already that I was going to get into this work that I do now, um, even before I sold it and was even doing it, um, on the side. And, um, uh, basically I was the client, uh, particularly body workers. I was, you know, I was a competitive Olympic style weightlifter is really what I was. So I got a lot of body work and I just cared very much about my own health and fitness. I absolutely took yoga classes and, um, you know, and so I was the client of so many other practitioners and just could see like, once I had built this like great business, I could just see where they were struggling. And the thing is, is I was going to people who were really good at what they did. And what was so sad, it still is sad to me, is like, you can have a fantastic practitioner and, but the business side may not show it at all. Sure. You can have somebody who's struggling and not like doing well enough, not making enough money, not getting enough clients, and they can still be fantastic. Or what you often see is just completely slammed, overbooked, fully booked, overworked people um, who, you know, have this cap on their income and, and, and are good. And so it was very easy for me to see like, oh, this is who, this is like my people and who I want to help. Right. Um, because um, I mean, my, my biggest why is around like, this has a ripple effect, right? That when I help practitioners serve their clients more powerfully and fill their cup at the same time, right? Get, be more sustainable themselves and have more time for their own self-care and health and family and so on. Um, that's just having this massive impact because that's hundreds of their clients on the other side of it. Yeah. So I think you asked how I got into this. That's how yeah. I got into yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when you sold your business and fully made that shift into what you're doing now. And, and I mean, I don't know if you would describe it as like you had one business and then you shifted to owning the business you have now, that entity, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, when, when was that? Like, when did you make that? 2017. So okay. I saw, I saw, like I said, I was kind of doing the, this kind of consulting yeah. and teaching on the side. And then, um, in 2017, I sold the gym and really Got moved it. into this as okay. for real. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Yeah. And it's funny when you were talking about when you, when you meet these people who are really good at their skill yeah. and behind the scenes, things aren't so great. I was literally listening to a entrepreneurial podcast today. And one of the entrepreneurs was talking about at the highlight of his business, which is making multiple, multiple six figures. He only had like 40 grand in the bank because his expenses were so high. He couldn't get a handle on why he couldn't get the money management piece down. And on the outside, everybody was thinking you're making millions of dollars, but he was feeling all this shame because he only had X number and he had a family with two kids. And he was like, why is this not working? Uh, he was not in the wellness space, but the model still sort of applies. If somebody is owning a yoga studio and they barely can make payroll and they're unable to pay for towel service and they're afraid they're going to need to cut some teachers that, you know, for the students who are coming to the studio, who are loving what they're doing there and the teachers there, that's like a really challenging position to be in. Do you, when you meet people who end up working with you, do some of them fall into that? Like, I know sometimes I meet a yoga teacher who is sort of at that precipice of, I think I just might quit. This is just, mm -hmm. I'm not about to be a teacher. Do you meet people like that? 
Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, what you're talking about is, you know, a profit margins issue. And so there's all kinds of stuff to, to do around that. I will just note, you asked me, how do I work with people? And I was talking about the front facing program, which is the business revolution Academy. That's our foundational program. Then we have a graduate level program. So people who finish the BRA come into what's called the leadership cadre. That's not even marketed publicly. It's only for graduates. And, and that with financial management is a huge piece of what we get into there and profitability, um, as well as scaling and just further yeah. systems. Um, so yeah, it's like, you know, in the end, when you hear stuff about how much people are making multiple six figures, as you just said in the, uh, or a million dollars, just say a million dollars, as you just described with that actually doesn't mean anything. Gross income actually doesn't mean anything, right? If you only end up with 40,000 in the bank out of it. So um, yeah, there's so many things and absolutely, absolutely. People get totally burned out and burned out and think, I just want to, I want to, tear it all down, or they think I just need something completely different. Um, uh, and often uh, it's really interesting. Something I think people get here, they'll end up in some sort of like digital marketing kind of funnel. And they often, you probably see this a lot, think that if they start building online courses where it's like DIY, like you just sell that kind of automated thing, they, they often, I get a lot of people who come saying, can you help me do this? And, um, to be clear, I don't help people do that because I actually, uh, I think a lot of times what they don't realize is that's a completely different business. You are essentially are making a product-based business doing that, not a, a service-based business. And it's a, it's your, for a product-based business like that, that's all digital, you're shifting your entire business to be a digital marketing business. That's, mm -hmm. that's where you put all your time and effort is to, is into digital marketing and digital sales. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas th in the model that I actually shared with you, you can completely clear out your schedule and be making as much with so much more space, right. And, and profit. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different levers to pull and, um, and, and I, you know, this is individualized for me. That's why I was mentioning, I was mentioning that what I teach is a, a consultative sales process. And so that free consultation is where in my case, for example, I'm assessing a business ahead of time before I ever invite somebody to work with me, right? I'm assessing where it's at and making sure like, can I help this person? And if I can, I'm going, okay, here's the steps that I would take you through. Here's the steps that I see, mm -hmm. which I'm sharing that not just about me, but that's actually exactly what you all listening would do in your free consultations right. as well. Right. Got it. So since we're talking about that free consultation experience, how do people find out about that opportunity to connect with you? How do you find people, especially when you kind of made that distinction between a digital product type business model where there really isn't a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversation between the teacher and the student, let's just call it that, versus more of a maybe brick and mortar or more of an in-person working with people. How do people find you to to know about what you offer and to me, hear, you know? Me personally, or you just means anybody listening, like how how does that work? Yeah, like how do you find clients that say, that raise their hand and say, hey, I'd like one of these free consults. How, how does that happen? Yeah, well, how do, how do clients find a class from you? It's just the same thing. So instead yeah. of sign up for a class, let's say people, let's say, give me an example. If people find you on your website or they find you on Instagram or they met you through somebody or whatever, somebody Got referred you. Got it. Instead of on your website or wherever it is that people are going, instead of book the class or book the session or buy the pass, it's the call to action is schedule a free consultation. Right. And I guess my question is in your world, as you get these consults set up with people and you're chatting with people about possibly oh me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You, how do those people come to you? How do you normally get people? Oh, like my lead generation? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just okay. curious. Are they like seeing you on Instagram and they're like, oh my God, I live in Chicago and I own a yoga studio. And I'm just kind of curious how that looks. Yeah. I have three main sources of lead generation. One is, should not be a surprise, podcast guesting. Here I am. Right. 
Um, and so just so everybody understands how that works, like, you know, I'm getting in front of somebody else's audience, in this case, yours, Karen, and I offer an invitation and that's what we call lead capture. So my invitation to your audience today is to sign up for the free empowered practitioner event, right? So that's something that anybody would do. If you're getting in front of other people's audiences, then you offer an invitation for them to get into your audience. And then once they're on my email list, I have nurturing content, right? Besides this free event, there's also nurturing content that nurtures them. Mm -hmm. um, second lead source is workshops and webinars in front of other people's audiences. So for example, I'm doing one, I think next week, actually, I'm, uh, uh, is it okay if I mention it? Oh, because God, of it actually might fit your audience really well. Yeah, I'm not really. sure if you know of the software offering tree, which is really oh. specific for yoga, yoga studios, yoga teachers. Oh offering tree. And, um, and so they are one of my partners. And so I'm doing a webinar for their audience and the cool. same thing. And in fact, I'll just mention it that yeah. the topic next week or whenever it is, is about, um, how to actually make free trial, free or discounted trials convert to long-term committed clients. So some Beautiful. of the themes we're talking, themes well, yeah, we're talking well, about today. Share the so link same, to that. Yeah. So that's a second source. And then the third one is referrals from current clients. Beautiful. That's always so wonderful. Yep. <laughs> That's always so wonderful. Yeah. I actually just finished a four week training last night. And that was one of the things I said to folks when we were done, like, Hey, if you really got a lot out of this and you know, someone, you know, some of them are actually in teacher training and they're taking my specialty four week training. So they have a lot of interaction with other yoga teachers. So I love that. That's always like such a nice way. I remember, I mean, I've been teaching long enough before Facebook was even invented. And that was how we found a yoga studio. Like mm -hmm. I literally remember when I would go to yoga class, this is dating me, I'm 59, people would write a personal check to pay for class. <laughs> there was no look on a website. None of that, yeah. they found out about teacher training was there was a poster on the wall. And before right. you went into the studio to take the class, after you <laughs> waited online for, I mean, it was an event to go and wait online, you paid your money, cash or check. Uh, I don't even think they took credit cards. Maybe they took a debit card, but honestly, I think in the beginning they didn't. You stood online, you saw a flyer, Sally's doing <laughs> a workshop on hip open, right. <laughs> John's doing a workshop on chakras and Baron's doing a teacher training in Mexico in May. And yeah. that's how you knew. And then you went in, you took your class. The whole thing was like a three hour pilgrimage, but that was what, that was how. So now there's so many different ways, but honestly, even in that day, referrals, were such a powerful way to find a customer, to find a person, to find a connection, uh, because it's somebody talking to somebody else about the impact that person made on them. So I, I yeah, always, yeah. That or, I just want to throw in because you asked me for me and I, you know, my business is is all, all the way online, but um, local, you know, brick and mortar. And if you you're teaching in person, brick and mortar businesses have a huge advantage when it comes to lead generation, which is um, SEO and Google My Business. So it used to be called Google Business Profile. Oh no, it used to be called Google My Business. Now it's called Google Business Profile. And so anybody listening, if you don't have that set up for yourself, that is a huge advantage. And so what that is, is if you ever like go search in Google for a service or something on the right-hand side, a box will show up or it can show up as um, you know a map and it will show you like the top three of that service on the map. And if you click on one of those, a box shows up on the right that like shows pictures of the business and their website and all that. So that's your Google business profile. And so you want to show up because the way all of our smartphones and our computers all are all hooked up to know where we are. So if somebody is looking for yoga, let's say they just moved to town or they've decided they need to try it or whatever it is, right? Or if you do therapeutic yoga and they're looking for physical therapy, like you can put those in as key terms, something like that, right? And you'll show up there. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a social media platform in that you can add pictures at, time, at times and keep it refreshed and keep it up to date. And that's mm -hmm. where you would have your call to action too, saying schedule a free consultation here, right? Right. Right. You know, right. And so um, that's a huge advantage for brick and mortar businesses. I, I know lots of people think that if they, you know, quote unquote, go online, that somehow they'll have such a bigger market. And the fact is, is that, yeah, you have access to people in the world, but you are one of how many 
tens of millions of yoga teachers, how are you going to be found online? Right. That's, that's right. hard. That's hard in online search. Um, whereas local businesses, you can make it really easy for people to find you. So just want to note that since you asked about. Yeah, that. totally. Yeah. It reminds me of something I heard on social media, something I, I, maybe it was Neil Patel or Gary Vee or somebody. And it was a story about a Thai restaurant somewhere that literally made the name of their business, something like find a Thai restaurant near me. Like they literally called the business what someone would put in Google search. And so they would get clients in their area or restaurant patrons because the name of their business was whatever the Query. That's hilarious. Yeah. Like, it was such an agnostic name, but it was such a great way of reverse engineering the process to get customers because just what you said, they're going to Google near Thai restaurant near me. And that was like the name of their business and they would get clients that way. Yeah. And I'll just mention because you were bringing up, you know, how, how at least some of your audience are contractors teaching in different studios. I just want to say like, that would be amazing. I'll bet you none of them are making their own Google business profile because they're thinking of that Google business profile as belonging to the, the brick and mortar facility. Right. But again, if you're a contractor, you own your own business and you could put that, choose one of the addresses to put yeah. and be calling out to your ideal clients. And you can have a list of what classes you teach, where at different places right there. And people will be attracted to you if you're speaking to them, like yes. who they are and calling in the people for you, hone in on who the right people for you are and call out to them. Yeah, totally. I mean, when I left, I originally started teaching for Baron Baptiste, as I was describing him before, many, many, many years ago. And when I, on my own choice, intentionally left that system that I really coveted working for when I was a newer teacher and I took his training, it was like, I wanted to manifest working for him and all of that. And I ended up getting hired to work there. I worked behind the scenes. I went to trainings and boot camps and the whole nine yards. And I got to a point where I felt like I wanted to do other things and I really couldn't do them because I was very much intertwined in this other person's brand and system. And so when I stepped out of that system and created my own brand and my own business, just what you are describing, I had all these other opportunities that I could now pursue. So I was an independent contractor, but I considered myself a brand and I created this whole portfolio of things I did, whether it was teaching kids or teaching adults or teaching in schools, teaching in libraries, you know, teaching privates. And over time, there was this whole portfolio of services that I offered and that became my business. It looks different now, but I think that speaks a little bit to the model yeah, that you're totally. talking about. Um, okay. So as we wrap up here and I'm just kind of making a mental note, I want to definitely share in the show notes about, uh, the event you're doing as well as the event you're doing in partnership with the software service. So we'll collect both of those invites okay. for, for listeners. Um, let's just kind of top this off. I mean, if there's something you want to share about maybe what's coming in the future for people, if they work with you, new things you're working on, or even just reinforcing what people can access in kind of the get to know you more, feel free to take it away and kind of put a bow on it in whatever way is most helpful to getting your message out there. Okay. Well, for number one would be the Empowered Practitioner event, which I just pulled up the details so I so I got, got all the dates right. So that's this May sixth to tenth. Um, it's so it's a week long. We I I, I it's a really in depth daily trainings is what it is with live uh, coaching calls. Um, that's fantastic. So I want to invite everybody to that. Uh, I have the URL for you. I'll send it to you. But anybody just listening, it's joannasapircom slash Empowered Yoga. And my last name is S-A-P-I-R. So joannasapir.com slash empowered yoga. That's happening uh, mid-May. When you sign up for that, you will get emails from me that, for example, introduce you to like, I have a podcast and, you know, it's called the, the Business Revolution for Practitioners. There's all kinds of ways to get to know me, but that event really goes in depth. And it's not even just getting to know me. That event teaches you like in depth, the framework I'm talking about. So my my uh, model in marketing here is I give away content for free. The work with me is actually implementing it. I have, I'm happy to share the information. And so it's very in-depth. Like it'll tell you exactly 
what structures to put in your business. And then if you want to work with me, you're invited at the end of that event to, uh, to apply for the Business Revolution Academy. Um, I think that's the number one thing. Like I said, mentioned that I have the podcast and, you know, I don't have the offering tree webinar info handy, oh, okay. but I, we, will, I will get that to you. Totally. totally. Um, and just for the people listening, just for you listening, um, when you go to the show notes for this episode, you'll see both of these events are linked as well as your social media contact information. So people can follow you there. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, like I said, I feel like so much has changed for both of us in the past two years since we talked. So this was such a great way to kind of pull it all together with the most latest and greatest news and information about what uh, what's going on with you. I love the story. I remember now your story. I remember the California part. Um, being kind of jealous that you live in such a beautiful place. Um, although I'm in Boston, I love Boston, but the weather there and the whole vibe is great. So I just thank you so much for spending time with me and sharing what you love in such a empowered way to keep with the theme of what we're talking about. And I'm really excited for people to hear more about it and to take action and getting to know you better. Thank you so much, Karen. It's great to be here. Okay. It'll go up on Monday. I'll send you right. the link. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for being here with me today. I hope you enjoyed it. And hey, one more thing. While I don't know you personally, I know what a yoga teacher looks like who's ready to work with me. She's ready to take action. She's looking for someone who has the answers she needs. She knows she's worth the investment. She can't wait to get all her prep time back. And she's excited to make a positive change. If that's you, DM me the words podcast offer to my Instagram, and I will give you a special incentive to work with me inside my signature program. My Instagram handle is bare bones yoga. I can't wait to hear from you.